He started looking at their, their blood cells, especially in their white blood cells, looking at their transcription factors and their genetic markers. And he identified this group of about 200 genes that upregulate or downregulate depending on, so interesting, our emotional state. It seems like we have these cells in our immune system that are actually listening, as he put it, listening for loneliness. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you, your loved ones, or clients suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health practitioners from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal. If you like this interview, please do subscribe and forward to others who might find it helpful. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. Florence Williams, welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm really excited to have you here. So you are a journalist, author, and podcaster. You're the author of this wonderful book called The Nature Fix, Why Being in Nature Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Creative. And your brand new book called Heartbreak, A Personal and Scientific Journey, which Publishers Weekly calls showstopping, which is amazing. <laughs> You're also a contributing editor at Outside Magazine, a freelance writer for the New York Times, National Geographic, and numerous other publications. And you're the writer and host of two Gracie Award-winning Audible original series, Breasts Unbound and The Three-Day Effect. You're a fellow at the Center for Human and Nature, Humans and Nature and a visiting scholar at George Washington University. And your work focuses on the environment, health, and science. So I'm really happy to have you here, Florence, because I absolutely loved your books. I thought they were fantastic. And as you may know, Mind Health 360, what I do is I look at the biochemistry of mental health issues. So depression, anxiety, insomnia, and what feeds into these. Now, you know, usually we look at gut and we look at neurotransmitters and infections and inflammation. And I know you cover a lot of this in, in your book, and so there's a lot of overlap. But what I've never really delved into was sort of relationships, loneliness, social connection, heartbreak. And that's why I was so interested. And also the impact of nature, which I touch on, but I've never actually done a podcast on the impact of nature on mental health. So I am fascinated to talk to you because I think there's so much rele relevance and overlap. And so I think, first of all, like, why did you write this book? Because, you know, you're a science writer. And can you tell us a little bit about what moved you to write this book? Yeah, sure. I will. And, and thank you so much for having me, Kiki. I'm a huge fan of your work and of your show. And I'm so happy to be here. Um, maybe I'll start just by giving you a tiny bit of background first on the Nature Fix book, um, yeah, because it sort of feeds in just sort of the next, the next event and the next chapter. Um, I, uh, I, I had spent 24 years living in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and Montana as an adult, sort of having this daily access really to quite beautiful nature. And then my family up and moved to the heart of Washington, D.C., uh, and I just noticed when that happened that um, I kind of felt like I freaked out a little bit physiologically and sort of emotionally and psychologically. I mean, I felt really stressed out. There was a lot of noise, um, you know, to go hiking uh, or walking in my neighborhood in D.C. I was under the flight path of Reagan National Airport. And so low flying jets every 90 seconds, you know, a lot of asphalt, a lot of noise, a lot of pollution. And I just, um, I felt more anxious and I had trouble sleeping. Um, I, I've had brain fog, you know, it was just, I just wasn't feeling well. And I started to think a lot about how our external landscape gets reflected in our internal emotional landscape. Um, I was aware that there was a little bit of new research coming out about this environmental psychology, but also neuroscience. Uh, and I got an assignment from Outside Magazine and then from National Geographic to really go around the world and learn what different researchers were finding out about why we feel different in the city as than we do in sort of you know nature environments and and even within the city if we're close to green environments or close to parks or using parks we have different health outcomes even after adjusting for income i thought that was fascinating 
Uh, and I ended up, you know, having a book's worth of things to say about it. Uh, and I talk about our senses and how when we engage all our senses in a natural setting, um, our, our, our nervous system responds within 15 minutes, you know, to the point where our, our heartbeat slows down, our stress hormones um, reduce up to 16%. Um, we produce more natural killer immune cells. I mean, all this happens like, very, very quickly when we're outside. So, okay, uh, so not to interrupt you, but the, yeah. the stats that really jumped out at me was that, you know, in the Japanese forest bathing studies that they were doing, they found that 40% of natural killer cells were basically increased by, I think it was three days walking in a forest only for two hours a day. And they, those natural killer cells, which are really important for cancer prevention and, you know, your, your general sort of chronic disease avoidance. Not only did they, you know, for a whole week, they were up by 40%, but then that effect lasted for several months. And obviously it wasn't up to 40%. I think it was 15%, but still, I thought that was really amazing. Yeah, and especially up to 30 days after. Exactly, which was incredible. I mean, just from two hours of walking in the forest for three days. Anyway. And, yeah, and to the point where, you know, researchers were telling me, really, we should all go sort of walking in the woods at least once a month, right, to elevate those those um, immunity protection, which of course we're also interested in right now. Um, but ideally, if we can go once a week, and then uh, you know, researchers from Finland and also from the UK are coming out also with sort of um, dosage, if you will, dosage sort of recommendations or prescriptions, showing that if we can spend up to two hours a week in natural settings, um, that seems to be optimal for our physical and mental health. Uh, and in, in, in Finland, it was a little bit less. It was like five hours a month um, to prevent mild depression. It's also really fascinating uh, in a country that is you know, struggling like we all are, all countries right now, um, with an epidemic level right, of, of depression, anxiety, um, obesity, and so on. A hundred. So then fast forward, um, you know, a few years, and I've, I've taken this information, and I'm, you know, starting to sort of use it in my urban life to try to seek out, um, you know, quiet bird sound and nature spots in my city. And by the way, that is possible, you know, it's possible for those of us who live in cities to kind of optimize these health effects. Um, but then my 25 year marriage um, hit the rocks hit the skids in a big way. Um, my husband, uh, really fell in love with someone else. It turns out he wanted uh, uh, to leave the marriage. All this was um, a, a big blow, a, a huge blow. I mean, I had been with him my entire adult life. I actually met him when I was 18. Uh, and there I was like at the cusp of 50, um, you know, facing uh, this completely unknown future, a lot of anxiety, a lot of grief, um, you know, two kids. It was, it was, just a tremendous blow. And I had never been heartbroken before. And I had always sort of dismissed it as being sort of overly dramatic, you know, and sort of melodramatic and just get over it. Obviously he's not the right person, move on. What's the big deal? But then when it happened to me, I was like, oh my God, I can't sleep. I can't digest food. I feel terrible. Um, I got I diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. Um, and I, you know, the science journalist in me was like, what is going on? Why is my body registering this emotional pain? And what does it mean for my immune system? And how do I get better as quickly as possible so I don't end up sick or so I don't end up sicker? And so that started the quest in this book. Well, that's, yeah. And I mean, good for you. It's like, you know, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade and it seems like that's exactly what you've done. And in fact, that's one of the prescriptions I think to getting better in your book is basically to, you know, develop a sense of meaning and, you know, and you talk a lot about the narrative and developing one's story. And I think it's Helen Fisher, who you were speaking to, who was talking about the importance of having your story. And, you know, you literally, you took that literally, I mean, you told your story and you've really turned it into something that hopefully can help 
a, a whole number of other people because all of us, I think, have experienced heartbreak, and you know, many of us, including myself, have experienced divorce, and you know, it is incredibly painful because it's not just the loss of your partner; it's also the loss of your family and the fact that you'll only see your kids fifty percent of the time, depending on your arrangement, and that you'll lose fifty percent of their childhood. Like, there's so much heartbreak not just in romantic terms but in terms of the family unit and your relationship with your kids so well done for writing that I mean you know that is really 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 important and the other thing which I read which fascinated me was that you were then you almost got diabetes type one which was that the autoimmune condition that you were talking about so you already had Hashimoto's I think and then which you'd been managing for years, but then you were essentially about to get this diabetes type one or you got it, which is quite extraordinary because most people are born with this, right? But you actually developed it and usually you develop type two diabetes. So tell us a little about, I mean, that must've been incredibly scary. And did you find out what it was in your biochemistry and your reaction to this that was causing these immune dysregulations? Um, yeah, I did. I certainly got a lot of um, kind of hints, you know, about what, what, why this was happening and what was going on. Um, basically, type one diabetes is sometimes called juvenile di diabetes. It's usually diagnosed, um, not necessarily at birth, but in childhood yeah. or in adolescence. It's different from type two diabetes in that it really is an autoimmune disease in which your body is attacking your pancreas and the cells that produce insulin. Um, just like in Hashimoto's, your body is producing some of the antibodies that are attacking your thyroid gland. Um, so, um, you know, just during checkups, my doctor said, wow, your blood sugar is really unusually high. Um, and she said, it's kind of strange because, you know, you're fit and you exercise and, you, you know, you seem to eat well, but, you know, you better stop just eating, you know, stop eating so badly, stop eating sugar or stop eating. And I was like, well, really, I don't eat badly, you know? <laughs> Um, so, so tried, you know, eating fewer carbs and eating less sugar and it, it wasn't really helping very much. Um, and finally actually it was a friend of mine who, um, is, um, is, uh, sort of a functional medicine doctor said, you know, you should have your antibodies checked because you may be producing these antibodies. This may be type one di pre diabetes, uh, as opposed to type two. And sure enough, I had the sort of the, the antibody markers, for this type one diabetes. And I was diagnosed with um, what's called LADA, which is um, a sort of a late onset um, adult diabetes. Uh, sometimes it's called type 1.5. So uh, I, I did have it, I do have it. Uh, I, I was still producing some insulin in my pancreas. So I was able to sort of radically alter my diet and my lifestyle in order to keep my blood sugars kind of in a safe zone. And by, so, so what I did basically was I, um, I really went very, very low carb to the point where I was sort of on a keto ketogenic kind of diet. And then I exercised literally after every meal so that I walked three times a day. And I was very motivated to do that because I wanted to stay off insulin um, at the time. So, so that's going on. And then at the same time, I was researching this book, you know, and researching what happens to our immune cells when we are facing a serious emotional crisis. I worked with, uh, especially a specialist, uh, at UCLA. His name is Dr. Stephen Cole, and he studies the genetic markers of people who are in crisis or people who are just sort of chronically lonely. That's kind of become his specialist specialty. He started out studying people with HIV and finding out why some of them progressed to disease more quickly. Um, and it turns out that it was people who felt like they had less social support, um, who died younger and got sicker faster. So he started looking at their, their blood cells, especially in their white blood cells, looking at their transcription factors and their genetic markers. And he identified this group of about 200 genes that upregulate or downregulate depending on, so interesting, our emotional state. It seems like we have these cells in our immune system that are actually listening, as he put it, listening for loneliness. And when they find it, they respond in a way that they think is 
adaptive <laughs> if we're living in the jungle, uh, you know, in our prehistoric state. And so it's so interesting. I mean, what our bodies do, what our, what our transcription factors do is they upregulate genes for inflammation and they downregulate genes that fight viruses because the immune system can't do everything. It has to make these choices. And when we're emotionally feeling like we're alone or lonely or have been sort of left in the jungle <laughs> to survive on our own, um, we need that extra inflammation because we're more likely to suffer a flesh wound or to be attacked by a predator if we're alone. And at the same time, we're actually less likely to face a virus because those are transmitted in groups. So it's kind of a smart response, you know, for 10,000 years ago. Yeah, I, mean, no. yeah. I, I found that fascinating in your book because, you know, you talk about inflammation and I was recently talking to Stephen Porges who developed the polyvagal theory and his big theory is all about social engagement, you know, the, the ventral vagal um, system, which is all about social engagement, keeps us safe, keeps us healthy. It's the rest and digest. It's, you know, and he talks a lot about inflammation, but the nuance that you've brought to this in terms of the different types of inflammation. So there's, you know, the inflammation, which is sort of, I guess, C-reactive protein and interleukin-6 are two of the sort of inflammatory molecules. And then versus the type one interferon, which is the virus fighting sort of, I guess you would still call it an inflammatory molecule, but in a different type. And it's fascinating because we know that viruses are very, very detrimental to mental health. So we know that 98% of Alzheimer's patients who have a biopsy done have herpes one. So mm -hmm. herpes simplex. We know that Epstein-Barr is a huge cause of mental health issues and also things like multiple sclerosis. So in our modern day societies, viral and viral fighting off viruses is hugely important, not just for our physical, but also for our mental health. So I was gobsmacked when I read this in your book, because I thought, you know, this makes so much sense. Like we're increasing all these inflammatory markers that actually we don't need, which are detrimental. And we're decreasing the ones that we really do need, which are the viruses. So continue. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's just so interesting that it's related to loneliness, right? I mean, loneliness, we know, is this epidemic disease now. Um, and in fact, I, I did the, most of the research for this book before the pandemic. Um, those markers of isolation and loneliness have only increased dramatically, um, you know, in the last two years. Uh, the rates are up to, you know, 30, 40 percent of adults um, in, in your country and in mine report feeling lonely. Uh, and it's especially true, sadly, among young people, sort of in that 16 to 34 age range seem to report the highest levels of loneliness. And of course, this is tragic because they're also setting up their immune systems, you know, that they're going to need for the rest of their lives. The good news is that it does look like with the right interventions, um, we can reverse both the feelings of loneliness um, and, and our genes actually do respond in real time. And our, our, our white blood cells are set up to do that. They're set up to respond within a couple of days, you know, of, of a difference, right, in our, in our outlook or our social life or, um, you know, our environment. And so I found that to be very hopeful that we actually can influence this. You know, and so then I felt like it was important to set out, um, you know, learning how to do this. And, yeah, and, and the inflammation piece, of course, is related, right, to the diabetes. So that, that was the link I didn't make, that, that it seems like inflammation, when it lasts for a long time, as opposed to just a couple of weeks of, you know, traipsing through the jungle, um, when it lasts a long time, it, it has this cascading effect of all these chronic diseases that so many of us now face. We can, yeah, and also in mental health. I mean, we now know that mental health, such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, are inflammatory conditions. Alzheimer's is an inflammatory condition. And so, you know, inflammation is hugely important. 
But when you talk about loneliness, because that's the other thing that really struck me. So you talk about heartbreak, but you talk about it in quite a wide context. So you talk about heartbreak over loss of habitat, loss of species, natural disasters, loss of trees. You know, those that's how you widen it out. It's not just, you know, it's grief, not just about the end of a relationship, but also loss, which is fund, you know, fundamental loss in, in our societies and our relationships and our environments. And I thought that was really interesting because you don't have to be heartbroken over the end of a marriage. You, you can also, you know, so then it brought me to the, the idea of grief. And you talked about grief, the symptoms of grief as being, you know, there were sort of three symptoms. One of them was stress. The other one was depression. And I can't remember the other one. Anxiety, probably, you know, well, it's probably kind of, anxiety. And it so to be kind of an unrecognized stage of grief, actually, that is very significant. And, and the other thing is that then there was this whole thing about loneliness, which you talk about. And then I was thinking, okay, but you know, you can be lonely without being heartbroken. So these are two slightly different things, right? And loneliness is an epidemic, as you were pointing out, in our societies and probably brought on by technology and the fact that we're all online all the time as well, but we're not really connected. And so biochemically, I mean, do you think that they have the same effect? Whatever type of grief or heartbreak or loneliness you're talking about, is the common denominator this sort of biological reaction? Do we react in the same way biologically, whether it's loneliness or grief or heartbreak or, and is that the issue? I think it's a really interesting question. And I think the scientists are still trying to sort of tease this apart. My understanding is that um, there are, are differences, for example, in depression that look different. The genetic markers look different actually in depression than they do for say um, grief or heartbreak specifically or loneliness. So these are distinct conditions and our immune systems seem to actually respond uh, in different ways. So the, the set of genes um, that Dr. Cole is really uh, looking at deeply are the ones associated with loneliness and they are different from the ones associated um, sometimes with depression. One of the markers of heartbreak, as, as I said, is often sort of a pretty acute anxiety uh, in addition to the grief. And so it, you, it's not always linked to depression at all. I mean, I, I, some, some people who go through heartbreak get depressed, but a lot don't. Um, I ended up not feeling depressed, but I did feel very anxious. And so that of course generates more adrenaline, more sort of a state of hypervigilance, um, the, the norepinephrine sort of jolting your system to prepare for fight or flight, right? As you are sort of imagining that you're facing the world alone and a future in which you're unprotected by a partner or by you know a close kin group because you're feeling that rejection and abandonment. Um, that's a really gonna be a different physiological and biological response um, than other kinds of loneliness even. So um, well, it's, it's complicated. It is complicated. And what I, what I also found very interesting is sort of, I felt that the common denominator was like a dysregulated nervous system. Yes. And so yes. the feeling that your survival is at threat, you know, so whether you're heartbroken or whether you're, you know, so maybe that's the difference is with loneliness and sort of the loss of a partner you and or a kin group or social rejection, you feel much more vulnerable. You feel that your survival is threatened and therefore it elicits a real stress response, a sort of fight or flight response. That's exactly right. Even just on a subconscious level, if you are feeling lonely, on some level, your body feels unsafe. Yes. Yeah. And that's how your immune system is sort of registering that emotional state. Now, there are people who live alone very happily who don't feel lonely, right? So it's important to make that distinction. They feel that they have great friends. They have strong social support. They feel very secure in their environment. Um, but I think sometimes what happens in a heartbreak is that it's kind of a sudden rupture. Mm -hmm. You very much feel the loss of you know, what feels like, you know, hopefully, um, you know, a sense of security. There's of course, a lot of relationships where, where people feel unsafe. And in those cases, people actually may feel better right after, after the relationship breaks off. 
if they've been unsafe in the relationship. Um, but I, you know, I had lived with one person, you know, next to me for 30 years and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure my body registered his absence as a state of threat. Well, it's interesting because you also talk very eloquently about the biophysiological effects of living in a sort of couple. So you talk about, first of all, the health effects of being married in a healthy marriage. I mean, if it's not a healthy, if it's a so-so relationship, it's not so good. But in a healthy marriage, you know, people live longer, they're healthier, they have less inflammatory markers, they have fewer causes of illness and disease. You also talk about this lovely bioregulation that your heart rates entrain, that your respiration entrains, that your cortisol levels even entrain, you know. Which, even your brain waves. Even your brain waves, which is fascinating. fascinating. And so there is this sense that being in a healthy relationship or a healthy couple is health giving. But, you know, as you say, it's really the quality of that connection, I think that's important because, you know, your, your book got me thinking a lot about the common denominator of all this, which is connection. So, yes. you know, connection to the self, if somebody has a very good connection, a healthy connection with themselves, then maybe that fulfills somewhat the role of the connection with the other. I don't know. I mean, yeah, that's right. And there, there are sort of overriding circumstances as well. So if you live alone, you can still have a great immune system. If you feel that you're living a worthwhile life, that it's fulfilling, that you have a sense of purpose and meaning. I mean, one of the most interesting things I learned about this book is that if you want to sort of maximize the health of your immune system, being with other people isn't necessarily the antidote. It's not necessarily the solution. The people with the healthiest immune systems are the ones who actually have a strong sense of purpose in their lives. Um, so regardless of your sort of relationship status, <laughs> you know, you can have a great immune system. Um, and in fact, we see a lot of older women who are single, who live a long, long, healthy life, more so generally than single men uh, who have a harder time feeling socially integrated, um, who are more likely to get depressed, more likely to indulge in unhealthy habits um, like smoking or drinking um, and being socially isolated. Than, than women who live alone. So I thought that was interesting too. So, so the, the health benefits of a marriage or of a relationship are somewhat uneven by gender. Yeah. Um, it and seems to really benefit men. Do you know why that is? I've always wondered that because I've known that statistic and I've always thought, you know, marriage is much better for men than it is for women. <laughs> if you look at the statistics, why is that? I mean, do you have an answer? Did you find anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I really think it's about culture. I don't think it's about gender. I think it's that um, um, men just don't do as well when they're alone. And, and this is men of a certain age, right, who that this, the studies are based on men who grew up, you know, sort of or were born towards the middle of the last century. So, you know, men born in the 50s, 60s, uh, huge sort of traditional gender roles often. Um, they rely on their wives in heterosexual marriages um, to arrange their social schedule, right? To provide sort of social life, um, to provide healthy meals, to tell them to go to the doctor. Men are terrible about going to the doctor uh, unless someone is telling them, typically a, a spouse is telling them to go. Yeah. Women are sort of, they're, they're, they're just, they're better at friendships they're better at healthy habits um, and they're better at sort of preventing, preventing disease. So I, I think that they're really culturally, um, culturally uh, influenced traits, right? And I think it would be interesting to do a study of, for example, um, gay men uh, after divorce, you know, they, they may do differently. They may be better at, at, at uh, sort of ignoring traditional gender roles. You know, they're better at maybe cooking and being social, both of them together. Um, or it would be interesting to look at men born uh, in a more sort of gender equal state, like men born, you know, in the last few decades, potentially. Although, of course, we all know that that these gender roles have a lot of stickiness in our in our society.
I sometimes wonder as the mother of two boys, whether we make a mistake as mothers of like over mothering our boys and we remove their ability to, you know, because that's our natural sort of thing as we mother our boys, you know, we mother our children and is it, is there, you know, but then we also mother our girls. I'm not sure, but is there something to do with the fact that these boys have been over mothered and therefore they're not as able to look after themselves or I don't know. I'm just, thinking out loud. I think there are so many subtle gendered teachings that we pass on to our, our children. Um, as you know, as feminist as we may be, as much as we may try not to, uh, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of um, lessons that are, are learned by our children, um, not just from their homes, but, you know, from their culture at large. And sure. so uh, I'm, I'm sure all these things make a difference in, in, how happy and fulfilled they feel, you know, in these roles later on. Completely. And coming back to what you were talking about meaning and purpose, because I think that's really, that was fascinating. You talk about two different types of happiness, and I can't remember which researcher you were talking to, but this researcher was talking about the difference between hedonic happiness, hedonic happiness, so hedonism, and then eudomone, eudo, it's, a hard <laughs> it's impossible to pronounce, <laughs> eudomoneic happiness, <laughs> which is a happiness that is much more purposeful. And they were showing that actually, if you look, they looked at the inflammatory markers and the immune markers of these two types of happiness. And they found that people with eudomoneic happiness, which is more socially engaged, more geared towards purpose, towards helping others to having a sense of meaning, had much better immune markers than people who were on the outside happy, but it was more hedonic happiness. And I yeah. thought that was fascinating. And that you know, came across as one of the key ways to really deal with heartbreak and deal with loneliness. And, you know, and, and you showed also that, that eudaimonic happiness really protected you against loneliness. So the ill effects of loneliness. And exactly. I thought this was really fascinating. You know, so much emphasis in our kind of popular mental health culture is about self-care. Nice. It's about doing yoga and taking bubble baths and having a facial. Uh, these are things that it turns out that are really linked to um, hedonic happiness. They make us feel pleasure. You know, we watch a funny movie, we eat a pint of ice cream, we laugh, we drink with our friends. It's all very mirthful. And we think that this is the good life. Um, but it turns out that our immune cells don't necessarily agree with that assessment. Our immune cells seem to be stronger and more preventative of disease if we are able to tap into this eudaimonic happiness, which is not a sense of mirth or pleasure, but is more easily understood as people who feel sort of deeply fulfilled um, uh, in their jobs. They know the why of what they are doing. Um, so if they're if they're having even a sort of unmirthful, stressed out existence because maybe they're in graduate school or they're pursuing a degree or they're caretaking people in their family, which can be full of drudgery. Um, it's not a mirthful time. And yet they can feel sort of, there's a reason I'm doing what I'm doing. I am completely on board with this. Um, I feel in some more cosmic sense, kind of fulfilled by this, even if I'm not like smiling all the time and taking bubble baths and, and their immune systems actually reflect that. And I think our cultures completely give us the wrong signals about this. It's true, but it's also what really interested me also was your work with these ladies who went on, you know, you went on a wilderness retreat with these trauma survivors. Yes. And that to me was incredibly interesting because you talked about the fact that people who've undergone trauma have this sort of dissociative experience often where they dissociate. So because they were abused often or had trauma when they were children and they weren't able to fight or flee, they go into this freeze response, which we know from the polyvagal theory is, you know, a sort of dorsal vagal response, a shutdown response, and they dissociate. So they're no longer in their bodies, essentially. And you were talking about how nature helps them get back into their bodies because it stimulates all their senses, you know, smell, sight, touch, etc. And also it helps them get back into the present. 
important. And why is this so important? It was so important for them because essentially by being in their bodies, they then wanted to care for their bodies, you know, and they wanted to, to look after themselves. And we do talk about self-care as one of the most important components of mental health. And what really, you know, so what does self-care actually mean? I mean, it's really important. It can be as basic as feeding yourself and sleeping well and making sure that you exercise. It can be very simple things. But what really struck me is that people who've been traumatized or abused often don't have that sense of their bodily functions or being in their body enough to think, or, or often it's just they don't think that they're worthy enough of looking after themselves. And so that was another thing that really came out to me was in, because, you know, we'll get to this, but your recipe for fixing these problems of heartbreak and how do we maintain sort of healing and happiness. And one of them for me was this self-care was being enough in your body that you do look after yourself, which, but then you're right. There's that contrast with looking after other people as well. Right. Well, I think, you know, what you're getting at is, um, is really interesting. I mean, we've talked a lot about the purpose and meaning, but that's almost the, the later, those are the sort of later stages of healing. What has to happen before you get there is you have to, you have to really get out of fight or flight, right? There's no healing that's going to happen when you're in fight or flight. And so almost the first thing that needs to happen after heartbreak is figuring out how to engage more of your parasympathetic nervous system, um, calm down your sympathetic nervous system, um, really just calm down. And it's because there's, there's no healing that's gonna happen until that. And so, you know, what I saw with these groups of, of women, I spent time in the wilderness, um, both on a river trip with um, women who had been in the military, and then also with a group of um, sex trafficking survivors. So actually both groups had largely faced sexual trauma, um, but also some combat trauma. Um, being in nature actually helps on two fronts with trauma. So as you say, there's often a dissociative quality to it. Uh, and, and being in nature can sort of slowly help us uh, feel like we're back in our bodies again, which is important for healing. Um, but the other thing is that after trauma, we're very hyper vigilant. So there's this extra, you know, norepinephrine coursing through us. These extra stress hormones. Um, we are constantly maybe looking over our shoulder, feeling unsafe. And there's something about being in nature again that can actually help us want to engage rather than kind of defend. So yeah. in the canyon. You know, we see the light on the canyon walls. We hear the eagle, right, soaring overhead. We can hear the sound of water lapping against the boat. You know, the moon rise, um, the, the, the bird song, the, the, the sun on our skin. It's a very gentle way to start to wake up the senses and engage the senses. So, so that instead of kind of retreating, and not wanting to go outside and not wanting to leave your house. Um, instead, you're like, oh, actually my brain feels kind of comfortable here. My senses can start to pay attention again. So it's really healing on both of those fronts. And in fact, the women, you know, I, one of the trips I went on was I think a, a five or five day trip. The other was a three day trip. Just the mood, watching the mood sort of, you know, lighten women started singing, they started eating better, they started sleeping better. All of these ways, you know, when our parasympathetic system engages, um, these wonderful things can start to happen. Completely. And I think that's, you know, again, rejoining the polyvagal theory, like being in a state yeah. of social engagement and ventral vagal as opposed to dorsal vagal um, and not fight or flight, but rest and digest is absolutely crucial for healing. 
And what you were saying also makes me think about, you know, what you were talking about in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs as well. So you were talking about, you know, the, the basic needs being met, your basic needs for survival and being in a safe place. And then you can graduate to the higher needs, essentially. Exactly. Exactly. And one of the needs that you were talking about, in fact, was this sort of transcend, transcendental need, which apparently he added later, which I thought was very interesting. Um, as sort of his sixth uh, need, but, and you talk a lot about, you know, you, you have an interesting experience with psychedelics and you talk about the sort of mysticism and the all, and these two things being these, these, this mystical experience of being connected. So everybody is connected. We're all one. And the experience of all, which is this sort of jaw dropping sense of wow you know we're and those two things being very healing can you tell us a bit more about that as well sure absolutely in in both books i talk a lot about the science of awe because i'm so fascinated by it uh you know it turns out it's a positive emotion that's been really understudied until recently um but it turns out as as some scientists even say um it's it's absolutely essential to be in human and uh, it's in fact essential to our sense of community because when we feel awe, it makes us feel more connected to each other mm. as well as to the universe, which I thought was really interesting. And so it's one of the reasons why our brains are sort of wired sometimes for religion, right? Or spirituality. It's why maybe we feel incredibly emotional when we hear a symphony. Um, when we walk into a cathedral and see, uh, you know, the stained glass, when we glimpse the Milky Way or see the sun, you know, setting on the horizon or the full moon rising, when we experience these things or the birth of a child, even, you know, when we experience these things, um, our brains kind of shut down, our cognitive brains shut down. So, I mean, I think we can all imagine this experience I had, you know, not so long ago where I was cycling some negative thoughts on a hike and I was just like, you know, churning over, you know, this sort of conversation I'd had with someone that was sort of upsetting. And all of a sudden this giant owl crossed the trail in front of me, swooped down. And I was just like, oh, you know, and that's a classic awe face where your eyebrows rise and your jaw drops and your eyes widen. You know, it's it's universal even to babies. You know, if babies kind of see something exciting and suddenly go. Oh. <laughs> so when we have that, our, our, our cognitive brain, that thinking brain just stops. And instead what happens is we're trying to understand what just happened. Like, what are we looking at? What, what is that? It's not something we see, you know, all day long, every day that our brain can easily put into a category. Um, so, so part of sometimes an awe experience is a little bit of something, a little bit unexpected, uh, and, and that kind of knocks us out, you know, momentarily that feeling, it turns out is linked to all kinds of amazing positive benefits. So after we look at a picture of a waterfall, for example, even in a lab, um, we behave in ways that are more generous. It, we'll, we'll take, we'll play a computer game right after we look at that, as opposed to looking at a picture of a parking lot. And the people who have looked at the waterfall will give away more lottery tickets or will act better as teammates. They will act less in their self-interest and more uh, in, in a sense of teamwork. So again, it's that, you know, it's, it's the reason why religions kind of have worked out so well for humans, because when we experience that sense of um, cosmic engagement uh, or spirituality, we become less filled with our own ego and more apt to do things that are pro-social, uh, which has been very necessary for the survival of our species. And I think it's so interesting now when you look at how we're living in modern life, where we are so ego-driven in the Western world. Um, and, and of course, this has really emerged, I think, during this pandemic. Um, we are less community minded, we are more ego driven, we are more ambitious, we are um, less aware of the importance of our social connections. And, and, and for the first time in the history of humanity, we have tons of people who live alone, like that never happened before in the history of our species. And so we're, you know, it's affecting our immune systems, it's affecting our emotional health. Um, and at the same time, we are removed from nature. 
So we're not getting that sort of daily dose of awe. We're not seeing the sunset. We're not seeing the full moon. We're not seeing the owl. <laughs> we're not making eye contact with other species, you know, unless we have house pets and that's actually very helpful. <laughs> so all these things are tied together. It's so true. And I mean, th these are some of the things that you mentioned that really helped you, you know, the nature, but it's not just that sense of awe from nature. It's also things like the smells and the stimulation of your senses. And I was amazed by the research that shows that certain smells of these sort of pine trees, these cypress trees in Japan really boost your immunity as well. And um, in fact, that's what they think was boosting this, for, causing this 40% increase in natural killer cells was the smell from the trees. And then if you add to that the all and, and the fact that it does make you feel connected to other people, I thought, you know, that's fascinating. So it's sort of an antidote to loneliness, this feeling of, and also I think it's something larger than yourself. You know, it's like nature is larger than yourself. And God is, or whatever you want to call this source energy is larger than yourself. And I think that's, and you, you made a very interesting point as well. You said people who are lonely are much more prone to being uh, sort of drawn into more extreme political movements, more extreme populism, more extreme, yes. you know, and, and that has real social and political repercussions, you know. It really, it really does. You know, Hannah Arendt even said, loneliness is a recipe for totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Very, very interesting and disturbing thought. But on a positive note, you know, one of the reasons I felt so motivated to write this book is that I, I feel like I was able to tell a story that hadn't really been heard before, um, which is, as you said, that, that experiencing beauty, experiencing awe is actually linked to resilience. Mm -hmm. So it is an antidote to heartbreak. It's an antidote to grief and an antidote to loneliness. And when I heard that, I got just wildly optimistic because I thought, here's, here's a kind of um, something we can do. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a personality trait linked to resilience. It's the personality trait of openness. Mm -hmm. And that largely means openness to curiosity, openness to beauty, openness to awe. And it's one of the only personality traits, maybe the only personality trait we have that we can actually shift. So studies have shown that we can learn to become more open. And so I thought, okay, that, that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend the next two years learning to become more open and trying to experience awe and beauty every chance I get. If that's going to help me recover and be healthier, why not? I already like nature. <laughs> I already wrote a book about that. Um, and so the psychedelic experience was part of trying to access that awe, you know, in sort of technicolor. Um, it was, it was, and in fact, research has shown that perhaps awe is the pathway through which so many people are able to find some healing when they take psychedelics. It's the awe pathway. That's so interesting. So there is such a thing as an all pathway, which I didn't, I didn't know. Do you know, I mean, is it linked to the dopamine pathway or the serotonin pathway? Do we know? Well, one thing we know is that, um, you know, what does your brain on awe look like or your brain on beauty? And what, what it seems to look like is that your frontal cortex is really dialed down. So that's where your self-concept sits. That's where your ego sits, right? People who have these kind of mystical, quote, mystical experiences when they take psychedelics um, have this complete dissolution of ego. Yeah. Uh, and I experienced that where you just feel like you're sort of one molecule among many <laughs> or, or a collection of molecules among many sort of floating through the cosmos. And you can't really tell where your molecules start and someone else's begin. And it doesn't matter. You're just in this beautiful sea of other molecules together. You feel one, you really literally feel one with the universe. And I had never experienced that before. Some people I think can achieve that through deep states of meditation. Um, but for me, and, and by the way, I mean, psychedelics are absolutely not for everybody. Um, but for me, I was able to sort of access that, that um, dissolution of ego. So there's the dimming down of the frontal cortex, and then all these other parts of the brain sort of connect in ways that they haven't connected before. So I think it's, you know, Michael Pollan, the journalist described it as, and I think he was quoting a, a neuroscientist, that what happens when you're on psychedelics is that your brain is sort of like a snow globe, and you're shaking the snow globe. And 
when you shake the snow globe, everything settles back in a slightly different place. Those pathways of the sort of stories of ourselves and the way we see the world, maybe there's an opportunity for that to be slightly shifted. And so if we've been telling ourselves a story of we are unlovable, um, you know, we are losers, <laughs> you know, we are this, we are that, the world is out to get us. Um, you know, it's through a big awe experience, whether through psychedelics or through looking at a sunset every night, you know, for a bunch of nights in a row, um, that you can actually challenge that worldview and have an opportunity to shift it. And I think that is absolutely fascinating. It is fascinating. And I mean, I've always been very interested in meditation and in achieving that. I mean, I'm terrified of psychedelics and I'm a control freak, but I do find that when you meditate regularly, you do achieve that sense of all and that sense of feeling of, you know, we are this and, and gratitude and just um, the, the miracle of what this life is. But, you know, you access that through, as you say, accessing a different part of your brain, I think. Um, and so an, another thing in terms of all the solutions to your heartbreak, I mean, we've talked about purpose and meaning, talked about nature. One of the other very interesting things is safe social connection. And I was fascinated by the what you were talking about in terms of people and primates who sought out opioids when they were deprived of love. And that actually addiction, you know, opiate addiction often is a, is a sort of panacea of some sort in terms of, you know, looking for love, looking for connection. And that fits in again with the polyvagal theory, which is that actually the key to health and happiness and longevity is social connection, social engagement, which is mediated by the ventral vagus, which is part of the vagus system. And, you know, and of course, then that brings in the whole idea of loneliness, you know, how do you get that safe social connection? And the other thing that I wanted to bring in was technology, you know, we have a lot of connection, a lot of social connection, more than we've ever had, but a lot of it is remote and mediated through these technological devices. Have you a sense of whether the effects are, you know, are the effects still valid, even if you're connecting through technology? And how do we increase our sort of social engagement? Like, what's your advice for that? Because we do know it's incredibly healing. Yeah, those are all, um, I think, very complex questions that researchers are still trying to figure out. You know, technology is so new, <laughs> really. Um, Zoom is so new. Is it making us feel connected and fulfilled? Is social media making us feel connected and fulfilled? I mean, the data is starting to come in, uh, especially with young people, you know, that the more they're on social media, in fact, the less connected and fulfilled they feel. Um, the more likely they are to become depressed and anxious. So I think that that's a big warning sin, uh, signal. You know, as humans, as you say, our, you know, you're talking about our, our, OP, our opioid networks, these evolved in social settings so that we would find social engagement rewarding mm -hmm. so that when we're with our friends or our family or our loved ones, um, our opioid uh, network, you know, is, is filled and happy and those receptors are sort of tickled and we want to come back for more, but that's based on things like the sound of human laughter, touch, we know triggers, um, oxytocin, it triggers serotonin, um, touch is really important to being a human. And, and that's true for all mammals. All mammals are social. Um, humans, it turns out, are hypersocial. And touch is a huge part of you know, how we feel fulfilled um, because of that engagement on our opioid networks. So you know, we can't really get that right now from technology. Maybe someday you know, we will, for better or worse. But not well, I, but, it, but it is worrying because so much, so many of us, especially young people are replacing human connection, normal human connection with virtual connection. And so it is a big worry, you know, what, what is the prognosis and in our children who are the first generations to have experienced this, you know, what is the long-term effect going to be? And another point in your book that I thought was fascinating was the warmth 
point. The fact that warm, whether you're drinking warm tea or you have a warm hot, a hot water bottle, these things release opiates, you know, and, and that there's a sort of that stimulates your opioid uh, network. And so I found that really interesting, like just have a hot water bottle or a cup of tea. And you don't, of course, get that from technology, right? Right. So maybe you don't have a spouse, but you can have a hot water bottle. <laughs> and in fact, you don't, right, you don't hear that as sort of a heartbreak cure, but it is really helpful for your nervous system to have warmth, to take longer baths, for example. Um, I, I, if you're feeling heartbroken, if you're feeling lonely, um, try that. Spend a little extra time, you know, in the bath and walk around with your thermos and, and you may feel better. Well, it's interesting. And then it made me think about Wim Hof and his sort of cold immersion therapy. Yes. You know, how does that impact? I mean, that has great. Well, that's the Northern that. Europeans for you. I don't know. <laughs> Very interesting. So we've talked about awe and social connection, mysticism. The other thing which I find interesting is there's always this dichotomy. You talk a lot about connection to self and self-reliance. And, you know, I think your, your river run on your own, a lot of that was about self-reliance and becoming independent. And a lot of the advice that you got from various psychotherapists was, you know, be alone for a bit, like learn to, to be on your own. So there's this sort of dichotomy on the one hand, being connected is healthy and wonderful and important, but also being alone, learning to be alone in a healthy way is also very, very important. How do you, could you explain more about that and what it did for you? Yeah. You know, I mean, there was one, my therapist said to me at one point, she said, you know, being alone is like a muscle. You yeah. need to sort of exercise it so that you can do it and that you're not, your nervous system is not going to freak out and you're going to feel incredibly threatened and unsafe, you know, if you're alone. And I had just never, I'd never lived alone before. Um, it was something I, I felt like it was very important that I learned how to do. I wanted to access a sense of bravery so I wouldn't be so fearful of this. Um, I wanted to literally um, learn how to paddle my own boat now, you know, it was me, I was now the pilot and I uh, had to learn how to do this. And so I thought a good way to paddle my own boat was literally to go jump in a canoe and head for the wilderness for 30 days <laughs> and learn to paddle my own boat. And so that's what I did. And uh, I tested my genetic markers, you know, before and after this little experiment, because I was kind of hoping maybe being in the wilderness would totally cure my heartbreak and cure my immune system. And I would come out after 30 days completely cured. And wouldn't that make for a great book? <laughs> um, so that was the idea. <laughs> um, but what happened when I was out there in the wilderness was that my body was in fact, kind of literally living out the metaphor of feeling like I was alone in the wilderness. Uh, which is not a state in which our, um, our nervous systems are relaxed, right? We have to really pay attention when we're alone in the wilderness and stumbling through the woods. So um, my immune cell markers, my genetic uh, markers did not in fact look better from an inflammation standpoint after my wilderness trip, which was a huge disappointment. Now, I mean, there were other great gains that came out of this experience. I did access a sense of bravery. I did learn how to paddle my own boat and feel more self-reliant. Um, I learned how to meditate better because I had no distractions. I did a lot of reflection, a lot of important journaling and sort of narrative creating. But in terms of feeling really safe, you know, I didn't. I, I felt like, wow, I'm out here on my own. I can't screw up. I can't tie the boat in wrong. I can't step on a sharp object. I can't get bitten by, um, you know, a, a, a scorpion. Uh, I have to stay really alert, 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 alert. And that's just not a state of um, relaxation. No, and I think that brings us back to what's so important is it's less about the state that you're in, whether you're heartbroken or whether you're low, you know, alone or whether it's more about how you feel, right? So it's like, it really, you could be alone and be very relaxed and feel completely loved and connected. And that will be wonderful for your immune system. In fact, it would be interesting to do those sorts of tests, you know, to take people and really it's an internal state rather than an external state. So it's, you know, how you get affected. I mean, it's like trauma, the same traumatic event will affect people differently. And so how one person gets affected by heartbreak 
and how the other person gets affected by being alone will vary according to their personality and their coping mechanisms, et cetera. And I think that's really okay. important. Yeah. And, and, and if you're interested in inflammation markers too, I mean, we do know that there are, there are a couple studies of groups of people going out into nature, such as on a rafting trip with other people um, that show that their immune, their, their immune markers actually do decrease um, after these wilderness experiences. So, um, you know, the, the idea wasn't totally misbegotten. It's just that the, the sort of being a, the solo piece, the being alone piece maybe was not the best way to get there. Well, that's super stressful also, because I mean, you know, you're on your own and your, your survival is at threat, which is the very thing that you're trying to avoid. Exactly. The very thing exactly. that you're being threatened by, which is being alone, all of a sudden you're exacerbating that, right? Exactly. So, I mean, that's, you know, hats off to you. But then I was like, darn, I have to keep, I have to keep writing the book because this is not the happy ending. I have to keep going and try all these other things now. <laughs> What do you think is the happy ending? I mean, what, what happened? I mean, how would you say looking three years on, I think, is it three years on? Actually, so now it's five. Five years, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I do think time is a big piece of it. Yeah. But I also have run across many, many people who, uh, and the science supports this, who really don't get over their heartbreak. I mean, I think like 10 to 15% of people continue to have a lot of struggle um, after, uh, you know, after, uh, an event, like a grief, a death, um, a heartbreak. And those are the people who are sort of skewing the statistics, which indicate in fact, that divorced people do die younger. They do get sicker. Um, and it's probably because of this kind of 10 to 15% of people who continue, um, to have health and emotional issues. Um, after the heartbreak. So that's why it's really important, I think, to get these messages out there um, to sort of speed people along and give them some hope and help them think about rewriting their narrative. For me, I end up kind of um, putting the heartbreak cure into sort of three big baskets. Um, and we've kind of talked about them, but I'll put them together in summary. You know, one is this calming down piece. So however you do that, whether it's through uh, you know, breathing or meditation or yoga or walking in the woods or being with your friends. So that's, that's the first piece is the calming down. And then the healing can start to happen, which really consists of two big parts. And one is this connection piece. So that's where you can connect in a more deep and authentic way to the people who will help, help you and make you feel safe and, um, you know, supply those, those, positive inflammation um, changes that we talked about. And then the third and final piece is this connection, as, oh, sorry, um, we did calm, we did connection, and then it's the purpose and meaning piece. So what lessons can you take from this adverse event, right? Moving forward, um, that can help you and ideally help others. And this is you know, what we sometimes often hear referred to as post-traumatic growth or post-adversity growth. Um, and, and this is in fact where the real magic can happen, where the scars, you know, in your heart can actually make you a better, stronger, more capable of loving person. I think that's really beautiful. I love that. And, and the, the other thing that always interested me was, you know, the experience of emotions. So some people are afraid of experiencing grief, but then if they don't, it's like a river, you know, you... I, I heard this expression somewhere. So a river, you know, furrows out a groove in the rock. And it's like grief furrows out this groove in the rock so that you can then experience joy. And I think there's this juxtaposition between the more you can experience certain emotions, you know, even if they're negative ones, the more you'll be able to experience positive emotions. It's sort of the people who flatline, who are scared to go there. They're scared to experience the negative emotions, and then they won't have the level of, you know, heightened joy that, that other people can access. So I, I think that's a really you know, lovely way to look at it. And do you think that that 10 to 15% of people who never get over their sort of heartbreak, is it because they're unable to learn these lessons that you talk about? Or is there something else at play? Who knows? I think it's probably a multi-layered um, 
kind of condition where yes, we are taught in our culture to try to numb, right, our feelings. I think that's a huge part of it. One of the huge surprises and lessons for me was that it's kind of wonderful to feel these feelings, even the negative ones, because they do ultimately make us feel more alive. And that ultimately makes us feel more connected, right, to other people, which is kind of the secret super fuel. So in those people, you know, they may have experienced childhood trauma or other traumas that make it harder for them to trust opening up and to trust the connections with others. And so I still think there's hope for people like that, but it's gonna maybe require more therapy and, 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 and maybe more dramatic experiences of, for example, awe. Um, we do know that in, in people who have experienced post-traumatic stress that, that sometimes the psychedelics can actually provide incredible breakthroughs. Um, and and as, as well as you know, these kind of wilderness and nature experiences. So I do think there's hope, but I think that we need to take heartbreak seriously. We need to resist the urge to numb and the urge to sort of self-isolate. One of the kind of confounding ironies of loneliness is that when we're experiencing loneliness, it actually makes us less trusting of others around us. And so there's a vicious cycle where um, it's harder to connect when we feel lonely. And so part of why I wanted to write this book is to really encourage people to try to break that cycle, to take it very seriously. If you are heartbroken, take it seriously. If your friends are heartbroken, help them, be there for them, take it seriously. Um, and you know, when we do this together, we can get through it. Yeah, and I think that's really beautiful. And it's not, just to pick up something that you said before, and then I'll, I'll um, <laughs> we'll wrap up because I don't want to take too much of your time. But I, I love what you were saying about this connection, the the secret sauce, the fact that essentially it's about you know when we're able to identify our own pain and our own suffering, and then realize that actually we're not alone, and that that's common to the human condition that is what enables us to look beyond ourselves and to realize that we are all connected and we are all connected in a sense through these emotions, through joy, through pain. And another thing that you wrote in your book, which I thought was lovely, was you said, you know, neuroscientists and philosophers and Buddhists all agree on the same thing, which is that life is suffering. And, you know, I, that, that sort of commonality of an inevitability of pain one way or the other, I think does unite us. And, you know, through realizing that we're in this together, there's a sort of transcendence that can happen. So, That's all very beautifully put, Kiki. I would just add that, you know, it's not necessarily that life is suffering, but that life includes suffering. Yes. But it also includes the, the, the things that really sustain us and, and the joy and sometimes the peace. And if we're lucky, sometimes the equanimity and that these feelings are transient and that if we really kind of process them and feel them uh, and integrate them and create these new stories, um, then we can keep going. I think that's really important that the, that's the other thing that the Buddha said is nothing lasts, you know, everything right. is transient and that's really important. And then one final thing before I let you go was your EMDR research. I thought the, the stuff that you quoted about the effects of EMDR and how superior they were to either, you know, pharmaceuticals or placebo were quite stunning. Um, and, you know, I, I, uh, I've, I've written the numbers down, but <laughs> I need to find them. But I did think that that was very interesting. So yeah, 30 times 90 minute sessions of EMDR relieve symptoms of PTSD in 70% of EMDR patients compared to 12% of exposure therapy. And then 88 patients with PTSD had 30% um, remission of their PTSD after eight weekly sessions of EMDR compared to 15% of Prozac and 12% uh, with a placebo pill. So, you know, and, and then that, those same, uh, that same cohort had 57% complete, you know, remission of their PTSD symptoms uh, compared to none of the other um, who had been receiving uh, SSRIs or the placebo. So I thought that was very interesting because you talk about processing our emotions and processing this pain, which I think, you know, and working at it, which is super important. And, you know, EMDR obviously is one way, it's a somatic 
uh, trauma therapy. Essentially, there are others. There's somatic experiencing. There, there are other forms of somatic therapies. But we're finding more and more now that actually for trauma and for sort of chronic mental health issues, that regulating the nervous system through somatic therapies is one of the most effective ways of healing. And I think that's important to mention, and you, you bring that up very well. Yeah, I was really fascinated by that too. I'm, I'm confounded by why it works. You know, it's, it's um, EMDR, which stands for eye movement, um, um, uh, De deprocessing, right? What is it? Deprocessing and desensitization and reprocessing. Eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing, such a mouthful. Um, you know, it's a sort of confusing about why it may work, but but it basically involves a sort of bilateral um, movement that you can do uh, in a clinical setting with your eyes, for example, going back and forth. But I also think it's interesting that some of these athletics that we do or activities like walking or paddling are, very are also this bilateral motion you know, that the human brain is kind of built, right, to walk. It's built to move bilaterally. And so there's something about our brains that like that, it seems to help us process emotion. Um, the idea with the EMDR is to really decouple the sort of emotional pain um, from the memory itself. So that eventually we get to a point where we can have these memories of, you know, unfortunate events, or um, you know, grievous events, um, and, and not feel like we are actually in the moment with the fight or flight response. And for some reason, it seems to really help a lot of people. It's really fascinating. Well, it's interesting because you were talking also, I think it was either Helen Fisher, it was the research on the prairie versus the meadow voles, but we were, <laughs> you know, they were saying that essentially love is a very strong emotion linked to a memory. And yes. prairie voles are able to have those emotional memories, whereas meadow voles aren't. And as a result, prairie voles are monogamous and you know stick with their partners, whereas meadow voles don't. And the difference is in that memory emotion connection, essentially. And then in the EMDR, you're decoupling that memory emotion connection. So right. there are times when you want the emotion and the memory to link together. And there are times when it's better not to. As exactly. Well. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, Florence, I must say you are so interesting and so wise and your books are so well written and so well researched. And I mean, you're just an amazing researcher and writer and thinker. And so I'm incredibly grateful to have you on this show. Is there anything else that we haven't mentioned that you feel that we need to mention? I, I don't think so, Kiki. I'm just, I'm so grateful um, to you for having me on. I, I think these, um, you know, these, these topics that you cover are so fundamental to our time. And it's just an exciting time to be a journalist because, you know, we're learning about them and exploring them. And, and I'm really, I'm hopeful, you know, that as we learn more about what makes our brains kind of function in a, in a healthy way, um, the healthier we'll be for it. Maybe completely, it. completely. And also, you know, the evolution of personalized medicine and being, I mean, your prime yes. example of, you know, having your blood markers. I was thinking, oh, I must rush out and have my blood markers done <laughs> like eight weeks of meditation to see how that impacts. You yes. Know? Wouldn't that be great? We're not quite there yet with these uh, transcription factors, but you know, someday it's, it's, it may not be too far off. No, exactly. And I think that'll be fascinating to see, you know, the physiological effects of emotion and behavior, uh, you know, yes. in real time, essentially. And I think we're working towards that, but you're right. We're not quite there yet. I would just encourage your listeners to make sure they find some awe and it doesn't have to be huge awe. It can be small scale awe, but, you know, go, go look at the sunset and, and smell some blossoms and hear some birds. I think that's that's a great piece of advice. I sometimes wonder whether my boys who are on TikTok, do they is there any all available on TikTok or Instagram? Does that count? Yeah, I, it kind of does. Sometimes there is amazing awe on TikTok. You know, I look at those the, the dance moves or whatever, and I, I I have that facial awe response. I'm like, wow, that was incredible. Yeah, you can find it, but better if you can engage again all the senses. All the senses. Exactly. Well, Florence, you're brilliant. Thank you so much and have an amazing, amazing day. And thank you for being here and definitely love your two books. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kiki. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal. 
and have given you some ideas about steps you, your loved ones, or clients may take to start their healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with our latest interviews on integrative mental health. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program.